Basketball fans, welcome into Raptors today, and it's a good day for the Toronto Raptors, despite the fact that Donovan Mitchell came to spoil the party. The guys were ready for the attack from the Cleveland Cavaliers, and we'll start talking about it. Entering the fourth quarter, down eight, the Toronto Raptors switched up their defense a little bit, but it was the defense that was a story. Jonesy, let's start with you, your impressions of what the Raptors were able to do to capitalize in that fourth quarter. Well, the defense was good, Akeel, and you know, it didn't augur well. Last year, they won only nine games when trailing after three quarters. New year though, and uh, the fourth quarter kind of epitomized what Nick Nurse always says. And his mantra is, no matter what, just keep playing. And I thought the pressure from the defense over the course of the game kind of cracked Cleveland in the fourth quarter. The Raptors made some shots to help them out, but they did a really good job uh, cracking down, forcing misses. I thought the loss of Darius Garland hurt Cleveland, particularly in that fourth quarter where Maybe their big guys had to handle the ball a little bit more than they wanted them to, but again, the pressure. And, and you know, when you play against that pressure, sometimes you make a play and you think, okay, I've made the play. No, you're going to get the ball again, and that defense is going to be on you again. So I think the cumulative effect of the Raptors' defense really showed in that fourth quarter. They were able to shut Cleveland down. And then again, they make five of their first seven shots. Four of them are three-pointers. Now you're energized, and your defense seems to be well, that much more effective. Yeah, the one guy that was truly effective, Sherm, was Pascal Siakam, build himself as a top five, kind of looked like a top five kind of guy. Yeah, he did, and, and you think about Pascal, it was from the jump. He was aggressive from the beginning of the game, and this is something that we talk about when we discuss leadership. How do you get it going? How do you get the troops and rally them around you to pick up their effort? Well, Pascal was aggressive from the jump. He was on the glass, did a good job being aggressive off the bounce. Defensively, he was active, he shot the ball. I just thought that for a first game in Impression, Pascal made a very good one to Raptors fans to show that he's ready to take that next step from a leadership perspective and also even him falling out late in the game it's an effort play he's trying to stop someone off the dribble gets called for the foul which was questionable but there's no question Pascal is engaged on both sides of the basketball and they're going to need him to play at that level consistently if they want to achieve their goals. All right now you talked about the next step for Pascal Siakam the next step mm. for Scotty Barnes was kind of the first step there are a couple of occasions where Scotty was kind of on the perimeter isolated and he actually took the initiative and took the bigger defender to the rim talk about what that shows for this young man and if that's something that he's going to start to kind of rely on more. Well I mean we saw it last year at times Akil and it was kind of sneaky because in the framework of the offense with guys like Fred and Pascal, I wouldn't say Scotty got lost, but that wasn't featured all the time. But you would see him have an advantage, recognize it, walk a guy down and score. And then he, he did it uh, yesterday uh, in, in the opening game. He did it by just facing up a bigger guy and taking him to the basket. Showed a little bit of his improved work over the summer, handling the ball, being able to break people down. But the pure joy that Scotty plays with. He just, he wants to win. He's, he's a terrific teammate in that sense, in that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who gets the credit. And there are times when he says, you know what, I'll do it for us. And we saw that in those isolation situations. But uh, it just shows how much he's worked on his game, what he expects from himself. He had a tough time early in the game. He had some questionable calls, a, a, a bad whistle in his eyes. And again, like Nick Nurse says, no matter what, just keep playing. He plays through it. The fourth quarter comes about. He sees opportunities. He seizes them, and it helps the Raptors get the win. All right, like Nick Nurse says, let's find out what Nick Nurse said today at practice. One of the things that keeps coming up with Christian is that he doesn't make a lot of mistakes for a rookie. Is that even more surprising as a rookie big? Like, I feel like with young bigs, it usually takes a little <laughs> bit longer than maybe some of the other positions. Yeah, I think that's what people say a lot, right? Um, and I just think that's probably um, more on court with, with um, repetitions and stuff. He's extremely bright, right, which is he understands what we're doing. Like I said, he's got a pretty big motor, which enables him to make an effort, right? It's like, like again, playing hard and making an effort still goes a long way of, of, of contributing to, to a team's success, and he's been able to do that. Nick, Christian had two vertical contests, one on Garland and then one on Mitchell, where it looked like Mitchell was going up for the dunk and he got that turn completely. Um, what's that say about his IQ to you know, 
stay solid, stay vertical, not get caught up in you know, that excitement? Yeah, he's done. He's been coached, you know, well, right? He's he understands when it's a shot block and when he can't get there, and he can still be a be a problem by just going straight up and making him move it around him. They get it. They do move it around him once in a while, but again, it's better than the straight end layup with no challenge. It's a, it's your choices, right? To block the shot, go vertical, or take a charge are the choices you got to make. And he seems to know, you know, and as a shot blocker, you usually are down to two, right? You're down, you don't see a lot of shot blockers taking a ton of charges. So he's he's done a pretty good job of reading that situation as well. Based on him, Precious, and, and Pascal, maybe the thing to do is start playing basketball later in life, right? Like, it, it's all, all three of them, I think, started playing at, like, <laughs> 15, 16, 17, and, and, and yet all things considered, like, all... all Three of them have pretty high IQs for somebody that, that didn't start playing until late, no? Yeah, they do. They're, they're, they're all three um, really good players and, and especially know what they're doing on the defensive end. They've Again, I think all three of them have some talent, you know, natural ability there to, to be good defenders. And then with the IQ mixed in, um, certainly helps. But I think, you know, back to your question, there's a lot of things that applies to in life. This time yeah. last year, um, you guys lost the first uh, game against the Wizards. Now, how important is you know getting the first win, but then also taking that into a team like Brooklyn? Um, well, I don't know. I think that one's probably done and dusted. I think uh, the um, game a year ago probably didn't have a great impact on last night's game, although I think we did feel like we were much – uh, more composed last night out there than we did a year ago. Uh, but there was so much uncertainty last year, right? Again, I think um, it's really important, like, listen, you go play a game in this league, you know, it's, you, get a, you get a win, that's what, that's what you need to do, and then you, we do what we did today. We, we had a great learning session. We really learned a lot from last night's game, and now we got to try to take it to the floor tomorrow and get ready for, for Brooklyn. I think you were mentioning it. You go ahead, one more. Sure. With uh, Pascal and Scotty, there were times where maybe they were getting a bit too deep uh, into the pace. OG, yeah, OG. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, but specifically when Christian was there in the dunker spot, um, did you see maybe stuff where he can learn like to be in a better angle for the pass and stuff like that? There was a few of those. Uh, again, I think I think um, we could show a little bit of both last night that the play was a little earlier to the outside. And then the play was a little higher to the inside, right? Yeah, you know, throw it up to guys with, with the reach and length that he's got. Yeah. On a night when a lot of big bodies were not available for this Toronto Raptors squad, the young guy was turned to, Sherm Christian Coloco. Now, when his name was called on draft night, we did not expect to see him contributing this early. But your impressions of how early he was called upon and what he was able to bring for coaching. Well, first of all, the young man capitalized on an opportunity. I thought he was excellent in his minutes on the floor. And, you know, watching him in the preseason and training camp, you saw a young man who was active, he's lively, he's got this energy around the glass, and he did a good job in terms of when he got his opportunities offensively, acting like he knew what he was trying to do, might not have executed it, but that's going to come down the road. But I love his activity. He's a presence defensively, he changes, he blocks shots, and then offensively, he's got that second and third jump when he gets after the glass. And that, to me, is what you have to provide for this team, be a rebounding force, be a defensive force, and he runs the floor extremely well. So everything this young man has done to date has been very impressive, and I think they got a special player in him future-wise. Most definitely, and speaking of jumping on opportunity, Precious Achua. Guys are out, and he definitely lobbied for maybe some more minutes in the near future. Yeah, his minutes were kind of shaved early in the game. I mean, he, he, he only had a, a short stint there, spent a lot of time on the bench, but you know, when you sit on the bench, you watch. You know, there's something going on. I'm sitting here, let me see what's going on. What does the team need? What can I offer when I get out there? And I thought Precious did a great job when he came back in late in the game. As he customarily does, he played with a lot of high energy. He was around the ball. 
you, you know, making shots, being in the middle of the action, being in the fight. I thought he did a great job, especially late in the game, of saying to Nick Nurse, hey, look, and, and we know Precious has that high confidence level. He feels that he can do anything, especially after a summer of working on his game. And I think he made a case late in the game for Nick Nurse to say, you know what, you can go to me and I can do certain things for you when you need them to be done. Sherm, the refs headed out for Pascal Siakam all night. I'm just going to say it. I, I even dispute um, the disputed call. I think it was it should have been overturned. But let's talk about the faith that Nick Nurse showed when Pascal Siakam was taken out of the game with those fouls. He turned to Delano yeah. Banton, of all players. Talk about the faith that shows and what this young man can do. Well, we've talked about it all training camp and all preseason, the fact that Delano Banton had a great summer in terms of summer league and the national team play. And then we saw him in training camp and preseason really start to put it all together. And that's something that Nick Nurse and the coaching staff has been looking for from Delano Benton. We know he has the potential. We know he has the skill set. Can he continue to improve? And over the course of preseason and training camp, he showed Nick Nurse that he could be that guy. And it's a telling sign with 16.3 seconds left. Pascal fouls out. There's some time you get to decide on who goes in. Delano's name gets called. He comes in in a crucial time where his team needed him to play possession basketball and execute on both sides, and he did it. So the confidence level, the trust that's put in this young guy, and understanding that they feel that he's a part of their future, so they're going to continue to give him opportunities. And to start the season, first game of the season, to be given that opportunity is a very big confidence boost for the young man. Yeah, a huge vote of confidence, especially on a night when the numbers weren't going your yeah. way. He still turned to you. And we're going to turn to the players as we head over to the OVO facility to hear the post-practice sound from an undefeated Toronto Raptors squad. You didn't start playing basketball until pretty late compared to probably a lot of guys in the NBA. One of the things that keeps coming up from your teammates, and, and Nick has talked about it, is your poise. That you don't make a lot of mistakes for a rookie. Considering you got a late start to the game, where does that poise come from, do you think? Uh, I feel like I just, that's just who I am, in, in, just in life in general. You know, I, I, I take everything kind of seriously. You know, uh, If I'm on court, you know, I'm going to try to make the less mistake possible. You know, Even in life, you know, what I'm doing in, in school, when I was in school, or doing an assignment, you know, I'm going to try to get the, better, the best grade possible. So I'm just, I'm just trying to be the best version of myself, basically. Christian Pascal was saying that you don't want to bother you before the game, figuring you probably had enough going on. Um, did he have anything to say to you after? Oh, we actually talked this morning. Well, we got here at the same time, so we're in the locker room together. We talked about it. He was just asking me how I felt uh, uh, during my first game, and you know, we just talked. He was like, yeah. He kind of told me I was a little bit, you know, stressed and like anxious at the beginning before I checked in. But the good thing was that I kind of knew I was going to play because coach told me after shooting around, like, you got to be ready. You're probably going to check in pretty early. And, you know, he saw me, he told, Pascal just told me, like, it's normal, you know. And now I got this game under my belt, so now it's just, you know, I kind of I kind of saw what I, I should expect. How does it feel to have so much, like, you know, confident teammates that believe in you, a coach that believes in you, you know, giving you minutes really early, everything? Oh, uh, I man. That's all, that's all you need as a rookie. Like you, you want people that believe in you, people that trust you when they put you on the court. And I feel like I, I got it here. All my teammates they trust me. The coaches start trust me, and you know, and and just myself, just just me being, just me, uh, me being me, just going out there and do whatever the coach want me to do, just to, to help the team. You no, know, not trying to do too much, and I think that's going to help me. How how do you feel running pick and roll with Fred? It was something he said it was great to have someone like you on the team who you could do that with. Oh, I, mean, I feel like it's amazing because Fred is a um, he's a really good pick and roll uh, uh, player. You know he knows he knows when to, to get me to pass me the ball. He knows when he's he can gonna attack the big man. You know so just having me my goal my goal is to get him free. It's to get him free. So when I set the screen every time, it's trying to get him free. And and like as we saw yesterday, he can he can really play good uh, off the pick and roll. What are you looking for when you come up to set that screen? Oh, I'm just looking to get him free, like I said, to set a good screen. And, you know, if I, I know if I set a good screen, I'm going to be open or he's going to be open. Or if they have too much, somebody else is going to be open in the corners and something like that. So you just to, to have a, a, to get somebody free, basically. There was one specific play where uh, you rolled, you got the ball from him, and then after attacking, you had two bodies, so you swung it to the corner. Um, and then after that ended, he kind of came to you okay. and spoke to you. What was he explaining to you there? Oh, oh yeah, I remember. I, I feel like it's just because um, I kind of caught the ball and 
I didn't, I didn't land on two feet, you know, and kind of my pass was kind of like, I, I threw like a left-handed pass, so he wanted me to, he told, told me to like, just catch the ball and land it and you know, just make, it, make a decision when you're on the ground, don't make a decision when you're in the air, so just some just stop for a little uh, stuff. How did last night feel compared to a year ago this time? Um, definitely felt good. I'm um, just kind of having a year of experience. I know it's not that much, but um, just kind of feeling like I've been there before and you know, a little less nerves and stuff like that. So it was good. Um, good to come up with a win for our first game. I think we lost last year our first game, so it was a good start. You had a nice uh, half court shot. In that yeah, I did. I remember that. Does that first introduction of the season ever get old in front of that crowd? No, nah. <laughs> never, never. I love the fans, and they always show us a crazy amount of support, and you know, we're grateful for it. So every time we get a chance to play, we're going to give it our all. You know. Have you given Christian any advice coming off your rookie year of sort of what to expect the the highs and the lows and, and, and everything? Um, you know, he talks to a lot of the older guys, um, but um, I would say that, yeah, we you know we talk here and there, but I'm um, just sharing that what I've been through. I'm um, just going through times of not playing and stuff like that. So just going through the G League and having my time there and just taking that to my advantage. So, you know, we talk, you know, here and there, but, you know, he's good. He's been doing great. He works every day. He comes in here, works hard, works on his craft, and, you know, he's playing with a lot of energy and he's going to be good for us. You checked in as the second point guard off the bench uh, last night. Is there any element that you're focusing on this season to bring to the team? Um, just trying to get to what coach needs. I'm um, do a lot of the little things. Um, play to our pillars. Uh, come in and try and change the pace of the game. Uh, pick up full court stuff like that. And you know, just kind of give these guys extra push. You know, they're out there working hard. Our leaders are doing what are asked of them. So you know, when we come in, we come out with that second unit. We got to do the same. What's it mean to you when Pascal fouls out in that crucial juncture of the game? Nick trusts you to go in there. Um, it means a lot. Um, definitely just uh, taking the opportunity. Um, whenever your name's called, you know, you have to be ready. So, you know, I was just trying to do that. I was in there for a couple seconds, you know, got in, got out. But, um, you know, it's great. It's good to see that, you know, he would throw me in there at, that, at such a crucial time. Of course, the Toronto Raptors started the season 1-0, and as you already know. But what you don't know is what the open gym cameras caught. So let's check in with the crew right now. Let's celebrate it. Wins are hard to get in this league, right? Enjoy this one. Till midnight. See you tomorrow morning for practice. Let's go! Raps, one, two, three, raps! One and zero, trying to go two and zero, and up next it will be the Brooklyn Nets, featuring, of course, one of the league's biggest stars, Kevin Durant. And knowing the pressure and you know the lack of support he may or may not have from his roster this year, because there's a lot of questions with Brooklyn. How high do you think uh, on the rankings for potential MVP do you have Kevin Durant sitting? He's Kevin Durant, so he's always in the conversation. And I, I think you know people need to start looking at. Uh, the overall success of the team. Kevin Durant is going to do what he does. He's going to score the ball. He may be one of the most gifted scorers this game has ever seen. He's going to do that. He's going to have Brooklyn in games because he can score the basketball. How well they defend will probably determine how far they go, but Kevin Durant will always be in your MVP conversation, and it's just a matter of how well his team does and how well they succeed in terms of how many votes he gets. But uh, they're a team that, listen, we saw it last year. In the midst of COVID, Kevin Durant played with three, four, five bench players and was still able to beat the Raptors in overtime. So as far as the MVP goes, always in the running for the best player in the game. All right, Sherm, there are two camps of basketball fans when you think about Ben Simmons. The camp that says, ooh, the league's in trouble when this guy gets into yeah. form and into shape. And others that say, two years off, I think it's done. <laughs> right? So how long before we know which camp is correct? I wish I could put a time on it. And I'm sure Steve Nash and the Brooklyn Nets wish they could put a time on it. But it's hard to really guess when he's going to put it all together, figure it out, get back to who he was, if he can get back to who he was. And I think for the Brooklyn Nets, he's such an integral part of what they want to accomplish that if he doesn't get there, I don't know if Kevin Durant's greatness and Kyrie Irving's greatness can overcome that. He's a big part of what they want to do, especially defensively with his size. And he's got to be a factor in terms of moving the basketball, getting on the glass, and being a playmaker. If he doesn't have those elements in his game because he's not an offensive threat like that, it becomes difficult to even have him on the floor. So they've got to figure out how to get him playing at a high level. And it's not a surprise that it, it will take some time, 
but I don't know how long Brooklyn can wait for him to get it going. It's early in the season. It's going to be some rust that he's got to shake off, maybe some confidence issues as well. But at the end of the day, he's such a big part of what they want to do that he's got to figure it out at some point if this team is to achieve what they expect to, which is championship aspirations. The story for game one was, of course, the Cleveland Cavaliers and the defense, the fast break opportunities, and we expect that to change as Brooklyn's a very different team. Let's talk about the offensive rebounding, the opportunities that sit there for this Toronto Raptors team. Well, the Raptors showed in that first game against Cleveland that they're going to be aggressive on the offensive glass, and that's something that should bode well based on the troubles that Brooklyn had in their first game, giving up 21 offensive rebounds and giving up 36 points off of those rebounds. So there's an issue there. And, and one thing about the Brooklyn Nets is as talented as they are scoring the basketball, they don't have the size up front. They don't have that girth in terms of their front court to be able to protect the paint or the glass. And the Raptors, with their wiriness, their activity, might have a chance to expose them on the glass there as well. Brooklyn's going to be an offensive team that is going to put points on the board. But can they get stops consistently? Do they have the personnel to get the job done on the defensive side of the glass and rebounding? They got completely exposed in game one. They're going to adjust to that. But can the Raptors still capitalize on that? And I think that's one of the areas of focus for the Raptors. Get on the offensive glass, create second chance opportunities. So hopefully they're able to do that against the Brooklyn Nets on Friday. All right, Jonesy, let's pivot now and talk about the next three and how the Raptors can kind of set a tone as they move forward with the season. Well, you look at the first six games. You know, you had Cleveland, who's an Eastern Conference contender. Then you get Brooklyn. And then you get two against Miami and then two against Philadelphia once you return home. So they're in a stretch right now, Toronto, uh, when you start the season with six games that are against teams that are expected to be really, really solid and fighting for the top of the Eastern Conference. So it's going to say something to them. It's going to give them a test right out of the gate and show them exactly what they need to work on, exactly how far along they were after the preseason and in the early season, and it will be a statement. I mean, you're trying to come through these games the best you can to say something about your prospects going forward. So uh, think about Miami. They lose a tough one at home on opening night to the Chicago Bulls without Zach Levine. With all the talk about what happened in Miami to end last season and moving forward into this season, it's got to be a disappointing result for them. So I think the Raptors are going to have their hands full. Miami's going to be out for a little bit of get back in, in the two games that they play Toronto. But this is a stretch for Toronto that will say something about them at the start of the year. And with all that said, up next for your Toronto Raptors, game two of 82 against the Brooklyn Nets, Friday night, 7.30. And you can catch the call both radio and television on the Sportsnet family of networks.